Hello again, friends. We are uh, in the chapter Work versus Work, and this is where we're trying to bring the lens of different historical examples to bear so that we can, as I was saying last time, to tune our own radar to picking up the dynamics of nonviolence in history and in our own experiences. And the two cases that I talk about now in this little subchapter called Taking It From the Top will go to illustrate that nonviolence is not the prerequisite of a certain group of people or a certain social stratum only. It can be practiced by anyone. And the most surprising thing is it can even be practiced by rulers. And this is why I don't like the term civil resistance, which is so much in use today among scholars for nonviolence, because it doesn't have to come from civil society. Usually it does, because it's civil society that's usually being oppressed. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's no union for oppressed dictators for them to guarantee their rights and so forth. But uh, it's by no means limited to them. So the first, historically, the first episode I talk about is the case of Emperor Ashoka, who ruled a large part of what is today northern India in the third century of our era, is someone who saw firsthand the results of his own violence, was deeply affected, uh, began a conversion to Buddhism and renounced war. That is particularly significant today because we have just had a conference at the Vatican where after 1700 years, uh, highest papal authorities are reconsidering the just war doctrine. And probably we should say more about that in a little bit, but talk about taking it from the top. That's the top of the Catholic hierarchy. One billion people, the Holy Father in Rome had this conference take place where they were reconsidering just war. And they are considering nonviolent responses, nonviolent alternative. So that, uh, maybe that's enough said right now about Emperor Ashoka. He certainly was ahead of his time. I talk in greater detail about something known to nonviolent scholars as the Holy Experiment. It was the regime that was under the control of William Penn in what is now Pennsylvania, and that William Penn was a direct follower of George Fox, the founder of the Society of Friends otherwise now known as the uh, Quakers, and how he began a, uh, an entire regime on what we would call nonviolent principles, including outlawing war. There was no conflict between white settlers and the Native Americans in his area. And uh, the, he, he promulgated this great law, which was way in advance in terms of restorative justice, in terms of anti-militarism, uh, in terms of religious tolerance, and even uh, the most severe kind of racial intolerance at that time, that between Europeans and the Native Americans. And uh, the interesting thing to observe is that this regime, this enclave of nonviolence, was not overwhelmed by outside forces of violence. Eventually it collapsed under its own loss of idealism, loss of comprehension. That is really important for us because if you talk about creating a nonviolent system, people will think, ah, we have no way of defending ourselves against violence from a surrounding area. But in fact, as I've mentioned before, nonviolence is its own protection. So I hope you enjoy reading about those two episodes and you agree with me that uh, the point is pretty well established and uh, you see in Gandhi's case that he was using nonviolence towards people socially beneath him, the untouchables, towards his equals, which were the uh, Muslim contingent, the other community, and towards his uh, social and political superiors, the British Raj. So, can be done by anyone, can be pointed in any direction, and it often will work and always works. Thank you very much. Till next time.